about you, but I need my prayers to be answered today. So I'm going to praise him in advance. Is that all right? I say I'm going to praise him in advance. I need some people to help us sing this song. Oh, praise him. Oh, praise him. Praise him. Come on, I need you to lift up your voice. Praise him. Praise him. Yeah. Right at morning star. Jesus. Late at night 
mercies which are new unto us every single morning. Thankful that we serve a faithful God who doesn't treat us as we deserve, but treats us as his son deserves. I don't know about you, but I know for me this was a rough and tough week, but yet and still God is faithful. And even through the ups and through the downs and the difficulties and the periods of confusion and sadness and sickness, God is still faithful. And because God is faithful, he's worthy of our praise. I just want to share a quick word with you this afternoon. I don't know if it's still snowing outside. Snow doesn't bother those of us from the Northeast, but it bothers me when it causes those of you who aren't used to it to drive in front of me and behind me. However, we'll do our best to make this as expeditious as possible. Somebody say amen. I want to share with you a passage of scripture found in the book of James, James the second chapter, James the second chapter, starting with verse 14, James 2 and verse 14 James 2 and verse 14 and I want us to read this together if you all don't mind just just stay with me let's read this together what good is it are you all there well, I'm reading from the New Living Translation what good is it dear brothers and sisters if you say you have faith but don't show it by are you all reading y'all aren't reading Let's start again. Let me hear you. If you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions, can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say goodbye and have a good day, stay warm and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing, what good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Verse 20. Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? 
you see his faith and his actions worked together his actions made his faith complete one more verse and so it happened just as the scriptures say abraham believed god and it was ca counted it him as righteous because of his faith he was even called the friend of god so you see we are shown to be right with god by what we do not by faith alone i want to talk to you from the subject this afternoon for the time we have left don't tell me show me father in heaven we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all that you have done now that the singing has passed and the praying has passed and the praising has passed god we turn to your word to hear what it is that you have to say to us we thank you lord for your abiding presence and we ask that as we open your word you'll speak to us as never before so that when we've left this place god we'll leave here different than the way we came and we'll be careful to give you all the praise all the honor and all the glory that will be do your name in jesus name i pray that everyone say amen amen it's very interesting after the events of the past uh, month or so here at New Life, I'm learning something about how police conduct criminal investigations. In order for them to put concrete cases together that can be properly adjudicated in the court of law, there are certain evidentiary procedures which need to be followed. Oftentimes, when people or when police approach a crime scene, they look beyond what maybe you and I may normally see by just looking at something. They don't typically rush to judgment or they won't even tell you sometimes what they think happened or uh, assure you that the culprit would be found. The major problem for police in conducting criminal investigations is to determine the utility of the information or the evidence of what is collected. One of my favorite television shows used to come on Sunday night. Me and Denise used to watch it together. It, it, it was called CSI Miami. Now, I don't really like CSI Las Vegas or CSI New York because I'm Bostonian. I don't like anything New York. But I, I, don't, I don't like those shows, but my wife watches a lot of these crime shows. She, she watches the CSI and the Law and Order and the Criminal Minds and all these other things that has this girl spooked in, in the corner. But she watches, those, she watches those criminal television shows. And what was so interesting about CSI Miami, if you watch the show, was the ability of the CSI detectives to see things at a crime scene that other people cannot see. Because of their training, a CSI investigator can see evidence that to the naked eye doesn't appear to be there. So they'll find a, a little speck of hair in, in some random place or a fabric or a fiber of blood on, on some, on, 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 in, in the bottom of a pool stuck in a drain or something like that. And it seems to the untrained eye that there is nothing there, but they can see evidence that you and I cannot see and they could put the pieces together. Furthermore, where you and I won't see a thing, they can take their ability to see above and beyond what we can see to say to this to say that this person was tall or this person was fat or this person was skinny or the trajectory of this went this way and so this person must have been seven feet eleven or something like that but they, they're able to see what we can't see and piece together evidence in such a way to draw a conclusive picture of what happened it's my opinion that here in the book of James, the second chapter, James is laying out a case for the evidence that someone walks with Jesus. 
James, of course, this is one of those epistles. This is a pastoral epistle. And James is concerned with the people that are, that, that are in his church and how sometimes they could go about saying that they're with God, but their actions sort of seem like it's something else. To James, James paid more attention, less attention to the words that professed I was a Christian and more to the deeds that implied that I was a Christian. To James, it was something ever evidentiary that needed to be coupled with what someone said they believed the bible says in verse 14 and if you would just leave the text up on the screen verse 14 the bible says james first approaches this investigation this way He's going to give them two demonstrations of what poor faith looks like. And he says in verse 15, 14, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? He says, take a look at this. This, this makes absolutely no sense. Can, can that kind of faith save anyone? He says in verse 15, suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say goodbye and have a good day, stay warm and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. The first type of faith that James talks about is James talks about a faith that is willing and able to only give lip service. The type of faith that only gives lip service are, are those of us that always have a good or encouraging word for someone. They are those of us that can always tell someone to go on and pray about it. Or, or they tell us that we, they have a problem and we say, don't worry, brother or sister, God has got it. We're so busy proclaiming that God is good that we don't see that God calls on us to do something based off his goodness for someone else. It's this kind of lip service that says, I love God, but I don't really have to hang around God's people. It's the kind of lip service that says, uh, it's okay, I, 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 can be, I can be blessed and I can be highly favored, but I don't have to be a blessing to anyone else. The problem that James first outlines in this type of faith that only provides lip services, James is telling people here that it's good to say to people, oh, go on and stay warm and, and eat well, but how am I going to eat well if I don't have any food? James says that it's faith to believe that God can and will provide, but there's something extra that needs to now be done to take the person from believing that God can address their problem to you being the conduit that God can use to bless somebody else. He says that it's, it's easy to tell people, everything about uh, about how you feel or it's easy to tell people uh, that it's okay it's easy to tell people that god has got them it's easy to tell them that that, that go on and and, and 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 be warm but you have no blanket to give them this implies here in the text that this is not having a lack of resources this is the, the people of God that, that, that see people in need and they know they have more than what they need, but they don't want to uh, uh, upset the equilibrium of their, uh, 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 of their homes in order to make themselves uncomfortable for someone else. So only thing they have is a word and they don't utilize the literal tools that they have at their disposal to help somebody else out. It's a type of faith that gives lip service then James says this but you don't give that person food or clothing what good does that faith do so you see faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds it is dead and useless now what do dead people do it's not a trick question what do dead people do come on what does dead people do nothing so what does dead faith do nothing. nothing you know it's those type of people elder maynard that want to say that they love god and they're christians but you can't call on them to do nothing when the nominating committee calls they're they're always so busy they they they, they can't take the time out of their busy schedule to do a little something for the people of god 
It's those type. It's those. It's those. It's those times where you say, "Oh, okay. Well, uh, 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 I know there's a need, but I rather continue to live high on the horse than to sacrifice a little to help someone else out that is in need." I want you to understand carefully here that James says that type of faith, that faith that will talk about how good God is, but will do nothing good in the name of God, James calls that type of faith dead, useless. Uh -huh. Then he talks about this. He says in verse, he says in verse uh, 17, so it should produce good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now some may argue, verse 18, some people have faith, others have good deeds. How can you show me your faith if you don't have any good deeds? I show you my faith by my good deeds. And he said in verse 19, you say you have faith, but believe that there is only one God. Now, what James is saying here is that James is saying that there's some people that in his church are having this debate about whether or not it is more important to have faith or whether it is more important to have works. Now, this is an argument that has divided many a denominations. This is an argument that has divided many a churches. This idea of are we saved by faith or are we saved by works? It, it, it's, it's a d debate that almost split even our church in 1888. This idea about righteousness by faith or righteousness by works. And here, James is saying some people say it's all faith that I need. And here, others are saying, it's not faith, but I can do something or I can work in order to earn my way into heaven. See, this is the challenge that I have with this logic. If we believe that we can earn our way into heaven, we then could take credit for things and pat ourselves on the backs and be a little conceited. This is what separates Christianity from other religions. In every other religion, there is something that you have to do in order to earn salvation. I have to either be better or, or I have to, I can't be say gooder. I have to either be better than I am bad. I have to uh, make a pilgrimage or I have to check off these sort of boxes or I have to make sure that I've taken ev care of everything on the list. I have to make sure that I m measure my money down to the penny and give this particular percentage. And the challenge is when religious dogma or religious denominations set up rules as if they are salvific, people begin to check off their boxes and they begin to walk around with their heads held high, real pompous and proud because they can earn their way into salvation so what does this create this creates this interesting dichotomy where some people walk and feel as if because they can check off their boxes they're better than other people but the downside of, of it is if, if I'm a part of one of these religions if I don't do right if I mess up if I make mistakes, if I fall a little short, if I can't let go of the pork and the shrimp and stuff like that, I get to start thinking that I'm not worth anything. Because salvation is something that I believe is internal to me, that I need to do something in order to earn it. I begin to beat myself up when I start to make mistakes. And that's the challenge that I have with some of us who feel that God does not have use for us because we make mistakes. That's the problem that I have with those of us who sometimes when we fall short or sometimes we mess up or sometimes we find ourselves where we don't belong, where we get a little depressed and despondent and discouraged because somehow we believe just like the pompous believe that we have to do something to earn salvation. But what separates Christianity from the rest of the religious world is that there is nothing that you and I have 
to do in order to earn salvation. It is something that is imputed to us. It is something that is given to us. All the work that needs to be done has already been accomplished on our behalf. So I can look back on what I've done and be conceited or I can look back on what I've done and get discouraged because somehow I have placed myself above God and believe that it's based off what I do that determines what I'm going to receive. But the truth of the matter is, James is saying, there's some things that should produce or be produced by your faith. It's okay to say you have faith, but I should be able to clock or I should be able to point to some of the evidences of your faith. I used to do this all the time. I was a real bad kid, okay? Um, and uh, I would always tell my mother, I, I wouldn't get in trouble sometimes because I knew how to sort of, my mom was religious at the time, well she's still religious, but I knew how to sort of manipulate her, so every time I did something wrong, she would say, boy, what did you do? And I was like, oh, well, I, I disappointed Jesus. And I figured this out because I got beat in front of my second grade class and I knew that I didn't want to experience that over and over again because it still follows me to this day. I get with my school friends and they're like, hey, I remember you got beat in second, yeah, anyway. so. I learned how to, I learned how to, um, do I say I manipulate, I learned how to manipulate my mother using spiritual things because I knew she felt, oh, I can't beat this boy. He understands he disappointed Jesus. Anyhow, I, I used to be, I used to be real bad and I used to tell my mother, okay, ma, I, I promise I won't do it again. I, I, I made a mistake. I forgot. Okay, whatever. I won't light my desk on fire again, ma. I promise. And my mom would always say these words to me. She would say, don't tell me, show me. And very interesting to me, uh, I began to learn or grasp this concept at an early age that it doesn't matter what you say, but it matters what you do. Uh, uh, how many of you all have a, a significant other, a husband or, or, or a wife? Let me ask you a question. How many of you all love your husbands or your wives? Put your hand up if you're sitting next to them. Very smart. Very smart. You see my hand up, Denise? Yeah, I'm waving it high. <laughs> Anyhow, the challenge is this. If your spouse said that they loved you um, and they didn't come home at night or they didn't treat you special or they didn't treat you with kindness or with respect, or with love, if they couldn't be depended on, the evidence would show you that maybe perhaps this person doesn't love me because they may say they love me, but their actions give me evidence to the contrary. We're there together, right? James is saying, don't say that you're with God if we can't tell from the evidence or the fruit of your faith that you believe in God. Okay, I got to go quick. The Bible says this then, uh, you say you have faith for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this and tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? What James is saying here is that a head knowledge of God is not good enough to save you. James is saying, okay, uh, uh, that's great. You know that God exists. But James takes it a little further. He says that not only is, do demons have a knowledge of God, but they even have an emotional response as in, uh, uh, they even have an emotion, emotional response to God. The Bible says not only do they know God, but that the emotion that they exhort is they tremble in terror before God. See, a lot of us think that it's okay to know God and to prove how much we know God by beating people up over the heads about how much about God and about doctrine and dogma that we know. We think that we are so great, but even the demons have better theology than we do. The de if you go through the if you go through the if you go through the, uh, the the gospels, you'll see over and over again the demons recognizing who Jesus is. Did their ability to recognize Jesus save them? The knowledge that we have of Jesus Christ will not save us. Even the demons know who Jesus is. 
As a matter of fact, not only do they know him, they tremble in terror at him. And I want us to understand that it doesn't matter how much emotion we have uh, in our relationship with God. It doesn't matter how much knowledge we have in our relationship with God. If information doesn't lead to transformation, we have not known God. This is the challenge. You see, we're really good as a church about bragging about what we know, aren't we? We great at it. Come on. That's what all that whenever you all say uh, we have the truth, that's nothing but you as Adventists being conceited and pompous. Because the truth is not doctrine, the truth is a person. And Jesus is everybody's savior. But so we love to say that we that, that we that we have so much of this head knowledge. But God wants to know that uh, God honors not our grasping of theological concepts, but what God honors is our ability to live those concepts within the context of our lives. You see, a whole lot of us grasp the concept of God. But when it's time to take the concept and live it in the context, we kind of come up short. Okay, I can see some of you all looking at me like, you're, like I'm crazy. Well, I am, but but but... but the concept is rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. That's the concept. It's in the word, right? But when I'm in a context that drives, that's driving me crazy and keeping me up at night, I don't feel like rejoicing in the Lord always. You there with me? The concept is trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. But when I'm in a context that looks like it's not working out for me and things keep getting worse before they get better, it's not easy to trust the Lord always. The concept is pray for your enemies. But when your enemies are getting on your nerves, it's not easy to practice the concept in the context. It's easier to cuss back and it's easier to lash out. It's easier to fight than it is to pray for someone that's getting on your nerves. The concept is pray for folk who misuse you. That's the concept. But it's not easy praying for folk that dog you and lie on you or that will stab you in the back. The concept is I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall all continually be in my mouth. But when I'm in a context where I don't have a job and I can't pay my bills and I'm single and all alone or I went through a divorce or, and my child is acting like they cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, it's not easy blessing the Lord at all times. The concept is bring the full tithe into the storehouse. But it ain't easy returning to God when the mortgage is due. And the car man and the, 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 the cable man and, and the electric man and the school loan man wants their money. It's difficult to practice the concept in the context sometimes. But what James is saying is if you're with God, there should be some tangible fruits that we can measure that let us know that you are with God. Then this, check this out. I'm almost done. Give me, okay, I got five minutes. All right. I'm almost done. All right. It says in verse 21, don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right by God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see his faith and his actions worked together his actions made his faith complete. And so it happened just as the scriptures say. Take a look at this. Abraham believed God and counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was called to be the friend of God. So you see, we're shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. Now, for those of you who've been in Sabbath school and read your lesson, I'm not acting like I'm all high and mighty because I read my lesson because I just started hearing it because they put the, elect, they put the uh, Sabbath school lesson on Alexa 
and I can add it to my daily briefing in the morning. So I now listen to the Sabbath school lesson, so I'm not like talking down to you all. But if you all have, because I just started reading. Um, so if you, if, you all have, uh, if you all have been in the book of Romans with the Sabbath school lesson, you would have come across Romans 4. Here Paul says, uh, it was imputed to, to Abraham, uh, uh, it was imputed to Abraham um, righteousness because of his works. But here look, look what Paul says. Abraham was humbly speaking the founder, go, go to the next set of texts. Abraham was humbly speaking the founder of our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? If his good deeds, this is Paul, if his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about. But that was not God's way. For the scriptures tell us Abraham believed God and God counted, it him, counted him as righteous because of his faith. How can James tell us that Abraham was counted righteousness for his works? And Paul tells us Abraham was counted righteous because of his faith. It's an interesting dichotomy in the text. And many people utilize this wrestling of the text between Paul and James uh, uh, to prove that sometimes the Bible has glaring contradictions. And it would seem like the Bible is using, uh, the Bible is being contradictory here because they're using the same character, the same text taken from uh, the book of Genesis, the same text saying that Abraham was counted as righteousness, one for his faith and the other for his works. How can the Bible be telling us that these two things, uh, uh, th that this same man was imputed for righteousness for two different reasons? What's interesting here in the text is uh, 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 Paul was Paul was talking, uh, Paul was dealing with uh, a particular audience, and James was dealing with a particular audience. Uh, Paul was an evangelist. Paul was in the streets and in the marketplace arguing with people saying, oh, should I go off and be circumcised? Oh, I don't think that that's right. Should I go off and should I go see the priest? And should I go off and should I continue to sacrifice animals? And Paul is sitting there saying, no, dude, chill out. Jesus has taken care of it. You're justified by your faith and not by your works. Evangelists. But James here, James is the pastor of the church of Jerusalem. James, Jesus' younger brother, is dealing with people that for their whole lives have been in the church of Jerusalem and they, 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 they believed in the word of God. And James, as a pastor, can't get his people to do anything. And because James is talking to a different audience, James says it's great to have faith and it's great to know that Jesus died for you and saved you, but your faith alone will not save you. There has to be something coupled with your faith or there has to be a process that you go through with your faith in order to prove that you've been with Jesus. You see, Paul is talking about Abraham before he went on top of the mountain with his son, where Abraham was, was wrestling with God, and Abraham was constantly doing dumb stuff like telling people that his wife was actually his sister and sleeping with his handmaid, uh, sleeping with his handmaid instead of uh, trusting in the word of God. Abraham was doing dumb stuff and began to believe in God that led him to take his son onto the mountain. And, 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 and Paul is saying, Abraham had faith in God and he was made righteous but James is looking at Abraham's life at the end of it all when he stopped doing the dumb stuff when he became uh, the, the, the father of many nations where Abraham began to be dependable and began to wrestle with God on behalf of other people and James says Abraham because of his works was made righteous before God what Paul talks about is this idea of justification. It's positional in that justification makes us right before God. Justification, sin separates us from God and justification separates us unto God. It is positional. And what James is talking about is this process that we all have to go to to move from where God found us to, mo to move from where he found us to, to, to move to where he wants us to be. And this way justification is extrinsic. But the, uh, it makes the sinner saved but salvation is intrinsic. 
It's justification that declares the sinner righteous and holy, but it's sanctification that makes the sinner righteous and holy as fruit from Jesus Christ. Justification removes the guilt from sin uh, having to do with the legal status, but sanctification subdues the love and power of sin having to do with our spiritual condition. Justification gives us the right of salvation, but sanctification gives us the beginning of salvation. James says here, faith without works is dead. The way that you prove that you're with Jesus is not by paying lip service. That doesn't do it. The way that you prove uh, that you're with Jesus is not having a head knowledge that Jesus, he came and he died and he rose for you. It's not just that. We're not just saved by our head knowledge. But we know that we're saved when life makes that transformation between information and relationship. We know that we're saved and we know that we're right with God when we have an experience with God that leads us not just to believe in faith that we know what, that God said what he said but now we believe and trust and know that because we are saved by grace we have to then be a conduit of that grace. That it's no longer what we know. But it's now what we do with what we know. It's now not just I profess to believe. But it's now I put my hand to the plow and I do something about what it is that I believe. You see, it's easy sometimes for us to get caught into this idea that God is pleased because we know him and we profess to know him. But God is not just interested in our ability to know and understand him. But God wants to know can he depend on us to be his feet and his hands. He doesn't just want new life to be able to say that they're a loving and a kind church. He wants to know and prove and test us that when things come our way that then forces us to be kind, be loving, be accepting. Are we able to do it? You see, most of us, we like to experience the freedom of forgiveness, but we don't want to forgive. We want to experience God's gift of his blessings and his riches, but we don't want to share his blessings. We want God to provide for us. But we don't want to give to someone else. We want God to supply all of our needs. But we won't help our brother and sister in need. You see, the way salvation works is because you have been forgiven, you forgive others. Because God has blessed you, you be a blessing to others. Because God has spared your life and has forgiven you, that means that you give someone else the opportunity to apologize or say they're sorry or to be accepted again because God doesn't throw you away. Faith without action is dead. Actions without faith is useless. We're saved by faith alone. <laughs> but works are to be expected. The evidence that you're with Christ is that you bear fruit. If you say you're loving, go on and be loving. If you say you're caring, be caring. If you get kindness, Give kindness. If you're blessed, be a blessing. And then take a look. Last verse here. Take a look. Bible says in James the fourth, James the second chapter. 
says this, just as the body in verse 26 is dead without breath, so also is faith dead without good works. You know, New Life, I know God loves to test us. I know God loves to prove whether or not we can be the way we say we're going to be. And every time that God tests us, God provides us with a unique opportunity to show not only to ourselves, but to show to each other and the world that we are with Christ. Because the evidence is not in what you say you are, but the evidence is in the being of who you say you are. Don't tell me. Show me. Don't call yourself a Christian and you won't do any work for Christ. You're lying. You're not a Christian. You're a Christian in word only. Word and deed. It's my prayer, New Life, that we will take this word and we'll apply it not only to our lives but into our interaction with each other, to the outside world, and to even in those situations that we don't seem to understand. God expects us to have faith, but to couple that faith with some works, the evidence that we're with Christ. Father in heaven, we thank you, God, for the assurances of your word. We thank you that you love us so much that you came to this earth to die for us, God. And so, Father, I don't know what those who are under the sound of my breath are struggling with, God. I don't know what the difficulties are. But for some, Lord, we can do better in the faith side. Some of us need to trust you more, God. We got the works down, but we need to develop greater trust. Then there are those of us, God, that we believe we have this head knowledge, God. But we don't want to have useless faith, God. And so... We need you to help us find the time. We need you to help us to find the room within our faith to begin to do and to prove or provide evidence that we're with you. So Father God, as every head is bowed, every eye is closed, perhaps maybe there's something that you've been struggling with. There's some crisis of faith that you've been having. And you just want to say, God, I, I, want to, I want to stand in affirmation that I need your help, God. I need your assistance. I, I want to do better with making sure that I couple my faith with good deeds. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it means that you got to love people better. I don't care if it means that you got to do better with your finances, that you got to do better being a blessing to people. If that's you, just stand to your feet. Father in heaven, you see us standing, God. We're standing in affirmation, Lord, that we need our faith to be strengthened, God. But, Father, we need our faith to produce certain works. Certain tangible, measurable evidence that we're with you. So, Father, whatever it is that stops us from doing that, whatever the blockage is, we pray, God, that you remove it from us. So that we can hear the direct speaking from your lips. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. Now, Father God, perhaps maybe there's also someone else under the sound of my voice that needs to give their life wholeheartedly over to you. They need to make that commitment, God, to go down into the watery grave of baptism and be buried with Christ and risen with Christ. So if that's you, no matter where you are, every head is bowed, every eye is closed. If that's you, if you know you need to give your life to Jesus, just raise your hand. 